Sure, I remember. Last April. The hearing was held in judges' chambers, but the story was all over town. A really vicious crime. Judge Parker was in no mood for coddling. This was no slum case. It couldn't be blamed on poverty or physical neglect. Just a kid who thought he was tough. So tough that he didn't care what he did to people. Or what people did to him. When Judge Parker threw the book at him, he didn't back down an inch, they said. Why should he care that a man had been crippled for life for a measly dollar and 16 cents? It was tough on everybody. That was the title of my editorial, Tough on Everybody. I approved the verdict wholeheartedly. I know. I discussed your editorial with some friends the day it appeared. But we thought it was more than the dollar and 16 cents that caused that boy to strike out with a wrench. It was something much deeper, something that should have been noticed in him long before the crime was committed, we felt. We talked that afternoon about setting up services in Kent, which would help spot this kind of trouble earlier. Marion Wright said that the Mental Health Association had been considering the same idea for years, but they haven't been able to swing it alone. Well, I thought we could all work at it together. And Kitty Anderson said she thought the state government had budgeted funds to help communities like ours. That's all I needed. I wrote down the name of the particular department she'd read about. At least I could try. Well, the following Tuesday, we went down to the uh, state capitol with Marion, and we met a Mr. Ashley there. He's in the offices of the Community Mental Health Services. Mm -hmm. And he said, he understood what we were talking about, but he said that the state sometimes does help. But they have to know a lot more about us. I'll just bet. Well, as usual, I was running away with myself. But Mr. Ashley said that uh, the state couldn't help us unless we could show that the town itself was involved. He didn't mean just a few active ladies. He meant the town. Local government, business people, professionals, educators, you know. And everyone who has a responsible role in the town. All of them? <laughs> Enough to guarantee that we're undertaking this thing seriously. Undertaking what thing? See, that's just it. We first have to make a survey of our needs and our resources. That's the first step. That's why we're setting up the uh, Kent Committee for Children. Yeah. Mr. Ashley has promised to come at least once a week for the next few months to help. Who's on the committee? Well, I have it here. Marion Cox, she's representing the Mental Health Association. John Brinker for the schools, Jane Anderson for the voluntary agency, Dr. Wheeler, the psychiatrist for the Medical Association, Bill Knox for the uh, Junior Chamber of Commerce, you know, Judge Gerhardt, and I'm hoping that you'll represent the press. I'm approaching others, clergymen, business people. It's going to be a big job. Big job. I couldn't even see what the job was. Fact is, while I run the newspaper in Kent, I don't consider myself a town leader. If I can get out a fairly readable sheet, keep the advertisers reasonably happy, I figure I'm doing a man's job. So I'm not one for committees in general. And this time it was all especially vague. I couldn't see what Sarah was getting after. Kent isn't perfect, what town is, but it's not a bad place. We live pretty well, the slums that I knew as a kid are just about gone. We've just about doubled our education budget in the last 10 years. And we're proud of our health services and all the other agencies in town that do community work of one kind or another. Besides, how do you survey the mental health of a town? Sure, there are lots of strange characters in Kent, so what? I do some pretty foolish things myself sometimes. No, I, I wasn't buying it. Then I began to find out through my own paper what a survey was about. For the next six months, people all over town were asking and answering questions. How were our school administrators coping with their problem, children? Do our businessmen have an abnormal labor turnover? Where do we go for help when we have vexing personal problems? What are the pressures in Kent that push young people toward crime? Committees of our own people were asking the questions, but they were being helped by this fellow Ashley, 
who came to town occasionally to work with the chairman. Turns out that I'm not the only layman who'd need help on a survey. It's an extremely complicated job. And my committee friends were mighty lucky to have a pro around to help plan their questions, to interpret the answers, to help them get at the significant facts. Ashley even went out himself on some of the more important contacts. For instance, he was the one who went to see Dr. Nolte, our public health officer, to tell him what the survey was trying to do and to find out what his special problems were. They talked about the emotional problems that they'd run into in public health work. And when I have time, I try to see some of these less involved cases myself. There is an interesting case. The mother resisted rehabilitation surgery on the child for six months. Miss Evans, the nurse in charge, was at her wit's end. Finally, we got together with her supervisor and learned that the woman lived in mortal fear of what she called the knife. We worked on educating her in the subject of modern surgery. You can see the results for yourself. I wonder if you realize the number of cases that we see here that resist treatment for one hidden reason or another. Personally, I don't have time for half of them, nor the skill, for that matter. Well, if the community could develop some kind of psychiatric facility, perhaps then you could get some help on the more difficult cases? And could we use it? Some of the chairmen who thought of public health as dealing with water supply and epidemics were surprised that Dr. Nolte was so interested in mental health and illness. Well, it surprised me, too, as a matter of fact. For at the public meeting held to announce the survey results, Dr. Nolte took the lead in asking for the establishment of a new mental health agency. He praised our local psychiatrist and the nearby state hospital. But he said that the facts pointed to Kent's need for a full team operation that would be the nucleus of a community-wide assault on mental illness. There are many agencies in town, including his own, who could help in this important campaign if we had a central organization staffed by specialists to guide the doctors, the teachers, the judges, the policemen, the social agencies, and the many other groups whose work was involved with the emotional problems of the people they were serving. Then there was a report from Mrs. Block of the Mental Health Association who said that her group was in absolute agreement with Dr. Nolte. She had many startling facts and figures showing the need for increased mental health services for people of all economic levels in Kent. One of the surprises of the meeting was old Ken Hoffman, who got up to say that he was with this idea 100%. As a merchant, an employer of many years of experience, he had learned that people's feelings determined how they worked and lived. Mrs. Flanagan spoke for the PTA. In spite of the improvement of our school, she said, the disturbed child was being neglected. The mentally ill, the retarded, the social failures of tomorrow were in our classrooms today. Now was the time to help them. Our executive committee has very carefully gone over the reports you've heard tonight with the help of Mr. Ashley, our consultant. And I'd like to make, to sum up our recommendations to you. One, we need facilities to treat children and adults with serious emotional problems. We must get them. Two, we need to try to ensure a good emotional environment for everyone in our community. And three, we must help the various professionals in town do a more effective job when they deal with the emotional problems that arise in their everyday work. And that's how Kent decided to set up a community mental health center. I still didn't know what it was all about, but the people wanted it and selected a group to get it underway. The new board had their first meeting that very evening after the general meeting. There was plenty of excitement and goodwill. A lot of hope, some highfalutin plans. But Ashley told them it would not all be easy going. Most of their problems were still ahead of them, and they had better be prepared for a lot of hard work and disappointment if they ever wanted to make their center a reality. I'm not sure they all knew what he was talking about. The next six months, if there was a dance in Kent, it was for the benefit of the center. When Young Women's League had an art exhibit, it was for the benefit of the center. 
There were concerts, bazaars, fashion shows. They all made some money, I suppose, but the total wasn't even a drop in the bucket. I heard from Sarah's husband. She was on the go 24 hours a day, soliciting funds, pleading, begging, and getting other people to do the same. Her network of phone calls branched out through the city, and each call set off dozens of others. It was hard, foot-wearying, time-taking drudgery. But Sarah is a real hard worker, and she did raise quite a few thousand dollars. And Dr. Nolte was able to get a small annual grant from our city government. But, as I had suspected, the campaign wasn't really successful. People's hearts weren't touched. Like me, they didn't know what this was all about. What bothered Sarah most in those days was the lack of interest on the part of the county supervisors. They were essential in this enterprise, and they weren't giving. Poor Sarah took it personally. About that time, Ashley blew into town on one of his scheduled visits. Isn't there someone in this town who could help you? Of course there is. Bill Watson. Well, tell me, uh, who is Bill Watson? There's no reason why you should know him. He's hardly here anymore. He still has a house in the valley. He visits it now and then. He happens to be here now. We were kids together. Later on in years, we were on the same school board. We had a terrible fight. I haven't spoken to him since. You really think he could help? He's full of influence and connections. Maybe uh, he doesn't remember the fight with the bitterness that you attach to it. Maybe. Maybe it's just my problem. Maybe that's why I never went to him for help. This was just the kind of thing that would interest Bill Watson. Why hadn't she gone to him first? Pride? Rivalry? The trip to the valley was not an easy one for her, but she went. Before she got home that day, the Kent Committee had the use of one of Watson's empty buildings on Murray Street for 20 years. Rent, one dollar per year. Much more important, this was the turning point. Suddenly the gates opened and money began to come in. Not long after, the county supervisors and the Board of Education had pledged support, and then the state was willing to sign an agreement with the local group. Watson's building was converted into a modern mental health center, but it took much longer to recruit a professional staff to work in it. They were lucky enough to get hold of a Dr. London, a psychiatrist who was soon joined by Dr. Kling, a young clinical psychologist, and Mrs. Powers, one of two psychiatric social workers they had hoped to get. I thought they were nice people, but I didn't expect any miracles from them. The next six months, I vaguely heard that a few people were being sent to the center by doctors, school principals, and so on. Then Sarah turned up in my office one day with this fellow Ashley, whom I'd never actually met before. I knew that when Sarah brings reinforcements, she's out after something special. I began on the defensive. What do you want from me? I've, I've, I've printed all your announcements. I've assigned my best reporters to cover your news events. You've had twice as much space as any other agency in town this past year. Now, for heaven's sake, Sarah, be reasonable. I know, Ralph. You've been a very good friend of ours. Even though you are as silly old for much. But what we need now is not exactly news coverage. I don't think the people in the town know what the center is about. What we need is an understanding and a sustained interest, along with the newspapers, to keep our center alive and active. But, Sarah, I can't turn this newspaper into a mental health publication. Why, my, my, my readers want news. They're not interested in psychiatry any more than they're interested in, in basic science or theoretical economics. They want facts. Besides, I don't uh, know what this health center does either. Can you write these stories she wants? No, but uh, your staff can. Why do you say that? Because they do such a good job of reporting on human problems every day. What do you mean? <laughs> well, take a look at your front page today. A fellow sets fire to a house over in Maple Street because a girl turned him down. 
Well, that guy's got problems, I'd say, wouldn't you? Here's uh, traffic accidents. Drunken driver kills a little boy over in Route 57. Now, why was he drunk? And why was he driving when he was drunk? A divorce story involving two of the nicest people in your town. A suicide. Now, how long do you think that woman was suffering with very terrible problems? Here's a girl, a high school girl, charged with possession of marijuana. Now, what, what's that all about? How beat does she have to get? Mr. Kohler, how did your untrained staff write this report on behavior related to emotional problems? It's a honey, and you printed it on page one. Oh, but these, these are people. These things really happen. I never thought about it from your viewpoint before. Maybe you're right. A little help, clinic. Technical. I, I, I wouldn't know where to begin. Well, exactly the same way you did this. The story's there. It's got drama and human interest. Some failures, success or two that no one might have expected. But just go on out there. If you don't like the story, don't print it. But go on out and see what's going on. We're, we're not looking for any special favors. As a newspaper man, I couldn't duck a challenge like that. I sent out my best people and we turned out three feature stories. The first one was called People in Trouble. We ran it opposite the editorials on a Saturday. Naturally, we disguised the names. The piece began with an account of Peter B., a charming, lovable little kid who I wouldn't have guessed was sick at all. Yet, Dr. London and his team soon diagnosed Peter's trouble. Little Peter lived in a world of his own, and he needed careful treatment in a hospital setting. But without the diagnostic techniques available at the center, chances are Peter's trouble would have remained hidden for years, when treatment would have been much more difficult. The second incident was about Mrs. T, whose problems seemed very serious when she first came to the center. Uh, she'd been referred by the Child Welfare Department after she'd come to them about having her children adopted. Seems that her husband was sick in the hospital, and she felt the world was coming to an end. That was when the child welfare people got Dr. London on the phone. But it turned out that Mrs. T was one of those people who get panicky under pressure. Sure, she had her problems, but they weren't of the deep emotional kind. Uh, she was assigned to Mrs. Powers for counseling. By the end of that very first visit, Mrs. T was in good enough shape to use some sound advice in facing a life that included three small children and a temporarily incapacitated husband. Her problems were real and practical. Mrs. Powers was able to give her some practical help in solving them. Mrs. T would see Mrs. Powers again the following week and go back to the child welfare department in the meantime. The story ended with a rather full account of Byron K a boy of 15 who could only read fifth grade books. It was pitiful to see him try to decipher words that would have been easy for a 10-year-old as he labored with Dr. Kling, the psychologist, in remedial reading sessions. He showed signs of being bright in everything except combinations of letters on a printed page. Other afternoons, he came to the center to see Dr. London, who talked with him about many things. They discussed the boy's friends, his feelings about his family, what he thought his reading troubles came from, but no real answer emerged. He admitted his eyes were all right in games and in target practice. It was only when it came to reading that they blurred. When that happened, he said, Sometimes I feel stupid and mad. I guess I am stupid. Byron seemed to need this false idea of himself. In the meantime, Byron's mother had been coming in once a week to discuss the problem with Mrs. Powers. So you do set quite a bit of store by the printed word. Well, naturally, I, all my life I've loved books, and my husband too. It's a very important part in both your lives. Yes, that's why we were so upset that he didn't read like the other children in his class. Well, and then I suppose I did push him a little hard. We just can't believe that he's that stupid. 
Yes, that's what I mean. I think you were right. Byron isn't stupid. He knew how important reading was to you. Well, naturally, uh, our house is full of books. Some evenings we, we just sit around and read. And Byron chose not to read. He really picked the one thing that could get to you and really stir you up. You mean he doesn't read on purpose? Not exactly. I'm sure that now Byron doesn't know why he doesn't read. But perhaps in the past, many times, he needed your attention and you and your husband were too busy reading to give it to him. Perhaps then he came to see books as his rivals and couldn't understand what it was about the printed page you found so much more fascinating than you found him. He could easily come to hate reading and to fear it, couldn't he? I just can't believe that we've failed. I know. You named your boy after a man of letters. Mrs. Powers did not permit Mrs. Kay's guilt to upset her too much, but it did provide a strong motive for Mrs. Kay's attempts to change some of her attitudes. We had a lot of mail after that article, and about a month later, we printed a second one. Lessons in Living, I called it. It dealt with the educational activities of the center staff. For example, Dr. Kling, the psychologist, went out occasionally to one of the electronic plants at the invitation of both management and union. He held discussion groups to help the workers prepare for the years when they would no longer hold down a job at the factory bench. It was not money he talked about. He underlined the importance of making an effort to build human relationships now that would be meaningful when they got older. He tried to stimulate them to find ways of using leisure time, which did not depend on muscle and energy. Dr. Kling reminded them that pensions could not buy serenity and dignity. Mrs. Powers took her educational work into school itself. She met frequently with groups of teenage girls. Well, John makes all the decisions for us. It doesn't make any difference to me whether we go to the show or to a malt shop. Is that bad? Well, I don't know. What do you think, Jan? I think it's terrible. All you want to do is boss her around and, and just push her everywhere. Why do you say that? If I want to go someplace, I think I have the right to say it. I mean, if I don't want to go to a movie, why should I? And say I want to go dancing. Well, I can always find someone who'll take me. Well, I think Janet here is the bossy one. I think a boy has a right to say where he wants to go. He doesn't have to go with me, you know. Well, that's true, perhaps. But what if you want to go out with this particular boy? Maybe that's why Sue lets John make the decisions. I think it matters less where you go than uh, who you're with. Well, now, Sue asked us before if that was bad, is it? No, I don't think so at all. That's exactly why we're here, to learn why and how and what we feel about certain things makes us behave in certain ways. On other days, the girls discussed marriage, their relationships with their parents, and many other personal subjects. They enjoyed the discussions. Some of the classes were held right at the center, where mental health movies could be shown. Tuesday and Thursday parent groups often saw films dealing with child development. After the pictures were over, Dr. London would lead discussions in which the parents tried to apply the ideas of the film to their own problems. Often, they would be helped to understand the reasons for their own feelings and actions. Often, they found that their Johnny's unique behavior was not so unique after all. Talking it over with other parents helped them to understand their children a little better. The third and last of the series I ran on the center was called Helping Those Who Help Others. It dealt with the consultative work of the center's staff. For instance, Mrs. Powers was called in by the Public Welfare Department. Some of the problems that had come up in the handling of deprived children, she found, could be traced to subtle negative feelings of certain staff members toward the mothers of large families, the very people they were supposed to be helping. The staff would be given an opportunity to recognize and discuss their feelings, which should enable them to work better in these situations. Sometimes the community's requirements took the center staff a long way from their clinical background. Dr. Kling, for instance, was called in at one point by the town's leading architects who were busy preparing a new housing project. Their problem had to do with what were the special requirements for aged tenants. Should they be in separate sections? Did they need ramps instead of stairs? Were special cooking facilities necessary? 
Dr. Kling was pleased at the opportunity to contribute information that he had long been interested in collecting. He was able to show the architects what was being done in certain European countries to make life a little better for the older people who had outlived most of their contemporaries. The most dramatic incident in the story had to do with a family whom we call the Joneses, who never knew the community was concerned about them. Mrs. Jones had died three months before, but now Mr. Jones had an even greater trouble on his mind. His 19-year-old son, William, had been acting very strangely in recent weeks. There were long evenings when William just disappeared from the house, prowling around the city. Mr. Jones had spoken to Dr. Kenyon, his minister, but nothing had changed. Although Mr. Jones never knew it, Dr. Kenyon was at that very moment discussing the case with Dr. London, who had come to the rectory to go over some center committee work. When they had finished their business, Dr. Kenyon had brought up the matter of William Jones. In telling Dr. London the story, he emphasized the fact that Bill had been surprisingly composed at his mother's funeral. No tears, no outward signs of grief. That can mean trouble sometimes. And I missed it completely. Then when he started fighting with his father and his sister, blaming them for his mother's death, I tried to talk to him. And soon I realized I was up against a blank wall. Now he's left his job, and I know he's in real trouble. And I can't help him. As you know, there is a big difference between normal grief and pathological depression. I certainly wouldn't venture a diagnosis on what you've told me. I think this boy needs a more thorough study before a decision can be made. I think I'll call Dr. Wright. It's a wise thing to do. Bill Jones was living his bad dreams. He felt that his mother had been murdered. In him there was a deep urge to strike back at anything, at anybody. The decision that Dr. Kenyon had taken that night averted trouble, perhaps serious trouble, for in less than a week, Bill would be in a hospital under treatment for severe illness. That story packed a punch because it made the work of the center mean something that our readers could understand. Those articles were printed three years ago. Now the center has a planning committee deciding what still has to be done in our town in the field of mental health. We're trying to encourage our own hospital to handle certain mental cases that don't really need to be sent off to the state hospital. We want to do something about alcoholism in our town. And there are many other problems. We are looking for new ways to reach our adolescents. And with all the help they need to grow into mature adults or to cope with the changing values of the modern world. Uh, how come I'm on the board, you ask? Well, it's quite a story. You know that Byron Kay that uh, was in that first article we wrote? That's my oldest son. He starts college next year. So I uh, feel I have a stake in this community mental health business. Don't you? Mm -hmm.